For as long as I can remember, I've been sincerely curious, and vocally so, about certain inappropriate matters. My most earnest questions, I've noticed, tend to cause other people to back away from me very slowly. You might say I'm a little too analytical for my own good. Isn't it unusual, I asked the absolutely horrified girl sitting next to me in my sixth grade homeroom class one memorable day, that my penis, when erect, is shaped more like a scimitar than it is a dagger. Certainly that must mean I'm deformed, I confided, whispering in her ear. Since obviously to penetrate a female like you properly, a penis must go straight into a vagina, not approach it from a 45-degree angle as mine stands. Over time, I learned to bite my tongue, but a salacious mind, once stirred, seldom gets rest. As I very slowly gained some much-needed social skills, I also found myself gravitating increasingly toward the world of science, a world in which nothing was sacred, no question too absurd or off-limits, at least for the sake of discussion, if not necessarily ethical fodder for the laboratory, and one in which I discovered other like-minded souls who didn't look at me as though I had three heads when I asked whether, say, people who prefer to be the recipient in anal intercourse might have a differently configured anal genital internal anatomy than those who find it intensely unpleasant. I still don't know the answer to that question, by the way. Speaking of which, I should probably also add, since it will become obvious enough by my disproportionate focus on male genitalia, that there was something very important to me that was denied full expression in my earlier years and that undoubtedly shaped my view of the world. I was gay. Very, very gay, in fact. I confirmed this incontrovertible truth through numerous experiments in my adolescence, including groping and kissing unwitting girlfriends, who in spite of their objective good looks and wonderful personalities, were as arousing to me as a perfume slab of ham with sparkling white teeth. This wasn't just the virginal jitters, I can assure you, but girls seemed to make my penis positively catatonic, while even from afar, boys made it stand at that oddly 45-degree angle I mentioned before. So let me start by offering a full disclosure. My perspective is that of a godless, gay, psychological scientist with a penchant for far-flung evolutionary theories. Still, although I certainly don't try to hide my own personal convictions, I'm an impolitic person. All I ask is that you try to suspend judgment until after you've heard at least a handful of essays. Just lean back, unbutton your pants, and by all means, get comfortable with yourself. Maybe relax with a glass of Chardonnay. And think. I hope to make that last part easy for you. I want you to enjoy learning about your wildly ejaculating penises, your dribbling vulvae, and your own fears, biases, fetishes, and desires. Despite our differences, and there are certainly many in this world, there is one thing we all have in common. We're human. I'm not interested in sensationalism for its own sake, but many of the questions that appeal to me most are, by definition, rather sensational. If you look at them closely enough, however, you'll notice how often the most titillating topics are uniquely able to raise deeper philosophical questions and to bring much more substantial issues to the surface. For instance, in reading about zoophiles, you may find yourself, as I did, questioning your own knee-jerk, moralistic sexual repulsions. A look at the evolution of pubic hair or acne unexpectedly reveals our close genetic relationship with other apes. Masturbation fantasies reveal what makes us unique in the animal kingdom, and foot fetishists expose how our adult turn-ons are permanently calibrated by often innocent childhood experiences. I do try to be a good scientist first and foremost, whether I'm investigating female ejaculation, six-month-old infants unexpectedly sprouting pubic hair, or the psychology of women curiously entranced by gay men. Since many of these essays were published originally in some form in my columns at Scientific American and Slate magazines, and therefore survey only the most interesting dimensions of any given topic, I'm certainly not able to cover every aspect and contrary viewpoint surrounding every issue. I encourage you, however, to explore further about the subjects that leave you wanting more. So please join me in impropriety. Let's not subscribe to the Some Things Are Better Left Unsaid school of life. How very boring that must be. I invite you to follow along with me on a journey of scientific discovery. But do watch your step. It's a slippery one. And note that although the mood is for the most part light, it won't be all fun and games. Some of the essays I've included in this anthology are actually rather sobering, including a really close look at the mindset of a suicidal person. I wrote that particular piece in response to the alarming rash of gay teen suicides in recent years. And that was an essay that resonated, unfortunately so, with many readers, some of whom courageously shared their personal stories with me after stumbling upon it. There are eight sections in this volume, each one representing a general theme or subject area and sampling the astounding oddities of simply being human. The first of these sections, Darwinizing What Dangles, 
includes everything you didn't know you always wanted to know about male reproductive anatomy. In part two, Bountiful Bodies, we'll examine how we may be designed by Mother Nature to consume each other's flesh, why we're the only ape that suffers from acne, and many other little-known things about seemingly banal body parts. Next, in part three, Minds in the Gutter, we'll explore some very dirty brain science, pushing our common sense into a few uncomfortable corners in the process. This prepares us for part four, Strange Bedfellows, where we'll take a critical, non-judgmental look at some of the more intriguing sexual paraphilias, fetishes, and conditions, exploring their developmental origins, theories, and debates regarding clinical diagnoses. If you think having sex with animals is inherently wrong, or that sexuality starts in adolescence with the first flush of hormones, you may come away from this section with an unexpected change of mind. In Ladies' Night, part five, we'll turn our attention specifically to the minds and bodies of women. Just note that I'm a gay man looking onto these minds and bodies, so my take is a bit different from most. Speaking of which, and I'm not sure what Nietzsche would have to say about the content of the following section, in part six, the gayer science, there's something queer here, we'll then focus on some of the latest and most provocative studies on homosexuality. In part seven, for the Bible tells me so, we'll examine how religion stems from our evolved psychology and how our standard burial practices aren't doing ourselves or the planet any favors. And finally, in the last section of the book, Into the Deep Existential Lab Work, we'll dig into some weighty, soul-wrenching questions about suicide, the meaning of life, and the evolution of joy and happiness. Excited? I hope so. And what better place for us to start than by asking why in the world testicles hang like that? And why does it hurt so much to get kicked there? <laughs> 